Hi everyone, my name is Matt Enloe and I'm the president of the Secular Legal Society. Thank you so much for coming out to our event today. We're really happy to have such a great attendance. Uh, today I have Lucian Greaves, the co-founder of the Satanic Temple, here to talk about the Satanic Temple and the law. They have acted lawsuits in Missouri and a number of other states. They argue for individual autonomy. Uh, they have a great campaign in Texas that, uh, and other states, I think, that lets kids not get hit in high school under religious exemption when they would otherwise be subject to corporal punishment. Um, and I'll let you, him tell you about all the other programs. So without further ado, please help me welcome Lucian Greaves, the co-founder of the Satanic Temple. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Well, so I'm speaking at the University of Chicago Law School, as you know. So I figured it would be most appropriate if I spoke about some of the legal suits we have in play. But the, uh, the problem with that some of the time is when I talk about the lawsuits we've, we've initiated and enacted, people get the impression that that's all that there is to it, and that's the, the very purpose of the Satanic Temple. So then the question of authenticity comes into play, especially when we are openly non-theistic. The question becomes, how can you be taken seriously as a religion at all? And then uh, questions about whether our lawsuits need to be taken seriously on the grounds that uh, we're viewed as, as no different than any other satire religion or pastafarianism. Um, one of the key things we like to argue as a satanic temple is that non-theism can't be held distinct from theism in regards to legal exemption and privilege because we think in a pluralistic society to, uh, to give superstition certain benefits and privileges, uh, certain protections over non-theistic beliefs is, is a very kind of backward system and, and very much against the, uh, the, the equity of the American spirit. Um, it, it would also be something of a stifling of religious, intellectual, and cultural growth, uh, I believe, if certain Christian factions are to become non-theistic and, and look more towards a, a certain cultural values and ethics that they hold, but also begin to migrate over into... Uh, into using science as an arbiter of truth claims. So we'd be better off and to have certain factions divided off into uh, uh, making these kind of disingenuous arguments for the, the superiority of, of their superstition it is, a, is a very backward road to take, I think. And further, um, when you do ask some of these questions about the Satanic Temple and the authenticity, you should turn those questions back around on some of the religious liberty arguments that are being made today and ask yourself, at what point does authenticity matter at all? And at what point has it mattered in the courts recently? Um, Hobby Lobby, as a corporation claiming to have a religion in which they are restricted from, uh, by their deeply held beliefs, to not pay health insurance benefits uh, that would include contraceptives that they view as abortifacients when, in fact, they are not. Uh, for one thing, I, I don't know where you could find anything related in Scripture that would justify this point of view. And furthermore, the idea of a corporation having deeply held beliefs is, is very troubling as it is. But the courts have taken these kinds of things on, on face value, and I think they never assumed that another group would come along and claim those benefits for their own as those doors are being kicked open and as questions of authenticity or... or uh, or religious justification have been completely bypassed, um, just taken with face value complaints that it's because of a specific religion that somebody's withheld from acting within the confines of what is normal social behavior today. Um, most recently, we've been in the news about the Supreme Court case coming up, forthcoming, about the baker, the Christian baker, who refused to make a cake for a same-sex couple. Um, the argument put forward by the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is an evangelical, theocratic, nationalist, little litigation group, is that religion is a protected class, uh, same sexual orientation is not. Um, therefore, by that system, uh, religious liberty, or the idea of religious liberty, really trumps uh, any, any rights the same-sex couples might have. They're, they're not a protected class again. So the, uh, people should be able to discriminate against same-sex couples. We then put out a statement saying that it would be interesting, of course, if uh, bakers were to refuse to serve same-sex couples, but were made to serve 
Satanists. If they were made to make satanic cakes, if they refused to make cakes for same-sex couples. Because there again, we're religion, religion is a protected class, they can't deny service. And this brings up a whole lot of troubling questions about uh, protected classes and discrimination. Um, race and religion are protected classes. So you hear these kinds of small gov- government conservatives carrying on about how businesses should be allowed to serve whomever they want, whenever they want, or not serve whomever they want, whenever they want. But I think it's very inconsistent if we, if, uh, if a gay couple who goes in and, and is refused service in a shop can't refuse service to the same group of evangelical theocrats on the grounds that... Uh, because they're a protected class in religion. That's kind of what we exploited when we made this statement saying that we would order satanic cakes from homophobic bakers. And I'm sure once the Supreme Court case is is tried and they uphold the right to discriminate, uh, that there will be uh, a lot more cases than, than bakeries to contend with. And, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very troubling road to go down. I was invited on Tucker Carlson recently to talk about this and, and we had a very interesting discussion. I'll, I'll show you that. But it wasn't the first time I'd been on Tucker Carlson. The last time I was on, we were talking about a campaign we did in Belle Plaine, uh, Minnesota. This small town where they had a Veterans Memorial Park, where they had a Christian memorial uh, to fallen veterans. It had a, it had a big cross on it. Um, somebody complained to the Freedom from Religion Foundation, a local from Belle Plaine complained to the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Freedom from Religion Foundation wrote a letter to Belle Plaine, advised them that it was illegal for them to put a, an explicitly Christian memorial on the public grounds. So then, I believe it was the Alliance Defending Freedom again, or another one of those evangelical litigation groups from out of state, thought they were clever and they advised uh, the Christians of Belle Plaine to pressure the city council there to open up the Veterans Park as a free speech zone, meaning that within certain defined parameters, anybody could donate a private memorial in honor of veterans. So we did. And that's what it looked like. And we actually do have a, a high membership of veterans. And, and, it was, and that was something we, we, didn't wanna, we didn't wanna take lightly and we did want to honor the veterans who, um, who have served and, and the, the veterans in, uh, in the Satanic Temple more particularly. And at first things seemed to be going along just fine. And then some Catholic group caught wind of this and uh, allegedly hundreds of them marched in this small town's memorial park. And not, not long thereafter, the city council resolved to remove the free speech zone entirely, uh, taking out both the, the cross and and denying us the opportunity to place our monument on the grounds um, after we kind of felt we had a contract with them for at least a year's placement there. That's still being considered now in the, in the legal framework. But uh, when I was going to go on Tucker Carlson's show, he had spoken about us previously. We had done something similar uh, at a Christmas display in Florida where there was these explicitly Christian displays and then in an assertion of pluralism, we put uh, a satanic happy holidays display. And then everything, everything melted down there as well. Um, and Tucker Carlson had been on the air that year. This was a couple years previous. And instead of having anybody from the satanic temple on to talk about our motives, he had a local pastor from Florida who then went, to put, then went on to put words in our mouths, say that we were just trying to insult and degrade Christians. And Tucker Carlson... Uh, then took it upon himself to adjudge us uh, fake Satanists because we're atheists. And then I was on the Tom Hartman show, and we were talking about this Tucker Carlson clip, and I said that it was ironic for a fake journalist like Tucker Carlson (laughs) to refer to us, anybody else, as as being inauthentic in some way. And Tom Hartman agreed. So I didn't know if Tucker Carlson had any of these things in mind when he first had me on, but I knew he was going to attack our authenticity over anything else, so I kept it focused on the free speech issue because Tucker Carlson believes himself to be uh, an upholder of, 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 of free speech values and, and, and very First Amendment oriented. So when he started saying that we're not a legitimate religion and, and other types of things that would take far too long to explain within uh, a five minute at most segment in which you're going to be cut off when you start making a point anyway, I, I just said, I just, uh, 
I just stuck to the, the premise that this was a free speech zone, and whether he believed we were authentically Satanists or not, that had no bearing on our right to be there and to offer a memorial as we did. And I think it hurt his feelings that he had to agree. So when he had me on again, I think he was prepared to be a bit more aggressive. Satanic temple is based in Salem, Mass. He's encouraging his followers to find Christian bakers and ask them to bake cakes honoring the Prince of Darkness as a show of support for gay couples who've been denied cakes for weddings. Lucian Graves is the co founder of the Satanic Temple in Massachusetts and he joins us tonight. Lucian Graves, thank you for coming on tonight. Um, I'm a mixed views on this. I mean, part of me wants to take it seriously because there are real legal questions here, but then part of me wants to tell the truth, which is you're just a troll. And you're working out well, on that. Uh, you're going to have to define for me what you what you think a credible religion is at this point. And then maybe you should thank organizations like Liberty Council or the Alliance Defending Freedom when they put forward legal cases claiming that they're taking a religious point of view and the Supreme Court just taking those at face value. The fact of the matter is we do have affirmative values. These are an expression of our deeply held beliefs. And I think that's all anybody really needs. Yeah, so we've had this conversation really before, the new blah, 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 blah. But I mean, right. in the end, this is about getting publicity and hassling people. If you really have sincere beliefs in your worst case, it's worse than these courts. I mean, I honestly, I honestly think, not to play shrink, but it has to do with what was clearly not a happy childhood. The question is, if you have these sincere beliefs religion, then why not practice it? Why waste all this time bothering other people who are minding their own business? Are, are you saying why don't we practice it in private and in our own churches and in our own homes? Because then I would say I'm, I'm completely on board with you, and, and that's exactly pretty much the message we're putting out. You don't see us going into public forums where there isn't already religious representation. What we're doing is we're upholding pluralism. And even in the case, case with the case... You're not upholding uh, pluralism. You're going and you're seeking out people to bother. And you're... you're we're not seeking out small people to bother. bother. We're not... We're not, we're we're not, not the ones opening, opening up... up this no, we're, 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 we're not the ones, ones opening up the forum. Do you ever have an evangelical on and ask them why they need to force their Bibles in the schools, why they need to put up a cross on public property when they have churches all over the place. I mean, when you open up that public what, forum, you what have to be prepared doing, for What they're not they're doing is show, hold on, so they're not, what they're not doing is showing up in your house and saying, you know, say the Lord's Prayer with me, Lucian Graves, and if you don't, then I'm going to sue you, or I'm going to get the government to launch a suit against you. You're seeking, you're, you say you and your followers, to say you have any, are seeking out small businesses that don't want to accommodate you in order to force them to violate their own beliefs. That's my well, understanding. It highlights a, it, well, it highlights a disparity. The fact is that religion is a protected class. Sexual orientation is not. If you want to be able to deny people service, fine. Let's be consistent. The, the gay hairdresser shouldn't have to dress the hair of the evangelical theocrat who wouldn't serve him a cake. Then we're on an equal level. Then well, that's actually, okay. I kind of that I'm fine with that. I mean, I think <laughs> it's your business, and and you're being asked to violate your beliefs. I think, and your sincere it's beliefs. Bring up some troubling questions, though, about protected classes. You know, and it, it does bring up. It does, does actually. Control. Yes, it yes it does. But one of the reasons that this was not an issue after the civil rights movement. I mean, no, no one's defending denying people service on the basis of their race, which is clearly immoral and wrong and illegal, and it should be. But questions like the bakery out in Colorado, one of the reasons those haven't arisen in the last 50 years is because people had a sense of decency and politeness, and they didn't feel that it was the right thing to get in someone else's face and force them for the sake of making some kind of public statement to violate their beliefs. You see what I'm saying? Like, they didn't behave like you. Sure, we should... Then, then the gay baker shouldn't be forced to make a, make a cake for the evangelical theocrat. Well, I, 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 I actually kind of agree with that. Here's, no, but here's the difference. I haven't seen a single case of an evangelical forcing any kind of bakery to bake a cake that violates the baker's personal beliefs. And if there was such a case, I would come down on the side of the bakery because why don't you back off and let people live their lives? In fact, why don't you do that? Lucian Graves. So, either take away the 
short minute. I think you should crawl back into your home. <laughs> 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 So he gave me a lot to think about there. <laughs> but um, but he, he still can't get over this idea that we, we don't have any deeply held beliefs and, and he refuses to acknowledge that we have any credibility whatsoever. And of course, I, I, you know, I, I really couldn't get into the argument talking about the, the history of modern Satanism and what we do believe in, in those types of things. It's very difficult to get in a word edgewise when you're on Fox News. But the, the fact of the matter is, is, uh, is as I was talking about Hobby Lobby and, and, uh, and the baker, there's, there's no litmus test. Uh, how often do you go to church? How, how closely do you believe the Bible? Um, do you believe in the, the, the Genesis story or, or not? Like, what, what, where's the distinction there? Where's the delineation? The courts haven't dealt with that at all. And to be fair, it hasn't been a question at all in our own lawsuits. And currently we have uh, two lawsuits in Missouri against abortion restrictions in Missouri. Of course, we're not litigating whether or not abortion is legal, but uh, some states have made it prohibitively difficult to receive an abortion. And in Missouri in particular, uh, this, the landscape's changing very rapidly now because of our lawsuit and Planned Parenthood lawsuits uh, being initiated there. But at the time we, we initiated the lawsuits in Missouri, there was only one clinic at which somebody could terminate their pregnancy, and that could mean that somebody would have to travel some five, six hours to get to the clinic. And then they need to receive these informed consent materials. And the informed consent materials went beyond basic medical knowledge, which is supposed to just inform you of what the risks you're, you're taking are in, in getting the abortion. But it was state-mandated material that put forward items, we felt, of religious opinion. And those opinions were that life begins at conception and that uh, each fetus is an individual and distinct human being and that to abort is to commit murder. I don't think they use the word murder, but the, the, the rest of it is all is all pretty much verbatim. Um, and we, we feel uh, within our tenets, the, the body is inviolable subject to one's own will alone, and science is the arbiter of truth claims. So as such, we were saying that a decision arrived at uh, through those values is religious free exercise. And when a member of ours went to get an abortion, in Missouri, uh, we sent her with an exemption form to the clinic, exempting her from the, from the informed consent uh, waiting period, because you're supposed to get these materials and then have to wait 72 hours. That's the prohibitive part. So when you travel some five hours and have to get daycare for having previous kids, which I think a lot of the anti-abortion crowd don't realize, I think some 59% of the abortions already have children to begin with, um, and then you have to pay either for overnight lodging, take time off work. It's, it's really just an effort to make it more difficult to get an abortion, just make it not happen. Uh, so this exemption form was taken to the, the clinic, and it was claimed that we didn't, we didn't need to honor this waiting period. We didn't need the informed consent materials. It was denied. She had to wait 72 hours. Um, and then as to whether she did or did not, get the abortion, we withheld that information, but in the federal court, the judge, dickhead that he was, sat on the case for like 10 months and then claimed that since it was past nine months, she couldn't be pregnant anymore. So that's what you call uh, uh, capable of repetition but evading review. And um, so he dismissed the case, and on the state level, they dismissed the case because they claimed that they didn't see how it fit in as a RIFRA claim, a Religious Freedom Restoration Act claim, because uh, we were using RIFRA, the same, same uh, act that uh, Hobby Lobby used, except on the state level, um, to uphold the rights of, of her religious freedom to deny the, the, those materials. So we, we amended our complaint, and we went back to the state Supreme Court. We, we appealed also the federal case. We haven't heard back on that, but the uh, state case has been, just found out yesterday, has been bumped up to the state Supreme Court. And um, I don't know when we'll have oral arguments on that, but 
you know, the fact that it is going to the state Supreme Court is considered a, a win in our, our favor and, and looks well. The, uh, the court opined that we do have a legitimate constitutional grievance and that it should be heard. And I, I think we do, and it's a, it's a very difficult thing for the courts to deal with because I don't think they can elevate these ideas that life begins at conception or even that the uh, fetus is an individual and distinct human being, uh, being that you, you are talking about something that can be a genetic blueprint for twins or, or anything else. When you're not, when you don't have higher cerebral functioning, it's, it's difficult to make that argument as well. And if they can't elevate that to a scientific absolute, then I think they, they will have to admit that this is a matter of, of personal values. This is a matter that is for, uh, for, for people to come to uh, their, their own religious conclusions. And it's one of the most basic fundamental values we have that people are able to come to these religious-based conclusions of theirs without direction or coercion by the government. And I think it'll be a, a difficult thing for the judges to uh, to deliberate on whether they're going to allow items of religious opinion to be put forward by the government, or are they going to rule in favor of the Satanic Temple. But the fact that that is a difficult question uh, makes you think about some of the, the claims about neutrality when they do allow religion in any public square. Anytime that happens, it's viewed as an endorsement of the religion itself. And we see that all the time. People do not, people do not understand that when we ask to give invocations at city councils, and the city council says yes because they're legally bound, we see that the general population does not understand that the city council is not endorsing Satanism. So you get the idea that they think the same when there's Christian prayers or anything else being given, that this is a license for them, that this is, that this is indeed a Christian nation and that they do indeed have a, a privileged status. Another lawsuit we have coming up very shortly is in Arkansas, where we are offering to put this monument up where they have a Ten Commandments monument about to be placed. Uh, we originally fought this battle in Oklahoma. In 2012, Oklahoma passed a bill that allowed for the erection of a Ten Commandments monument on the Capitol grounds. And the claim was that this, didn't, uh, this wasn't an Establishment Clause case because, uh, for one, the monument was a private donation. Anybody could uh, presumably um, donate, donate monuments similar to the Bell Plain situation, kind of a free speech zone for, for monuments. But the construction requirements were, were much more elaborate, so I didn't think they, they uh, assumed anybody would come through on something like this. Um, but um, they also said that it served a secular purpose, the Ten Commandments monument. And, and these Ten Commandments cases often cite Van Orden versus Perry, which is a, a Ten Commandments case which, which allowed for the Ten Commandments to remain standing in Austin, Texas. But there was... There were certain caveats in that case. I, I still don't agree with them. But the, the claim was that the Ten Commandments monument in Austin had been there for 40-plus years and had become something of a landmark. And also, there was a variety of monuments from different point of views, meaning different things, and no evidence of discrimination between them. Um, in the case of Oklahoma, they wouldn't have had any of those things because it would have the Ten Commandments would have gone up. It, it obviously has religious implications. Um, they claim it also has these secular implications where it, it's just honoring the codification of the American legal code because the idea, supposedly, is that the Ten Commandments had something to do with, the, the, with constitutional law. And if anybody has read either of the two, they would know that that's not true. But we, uh, we came up with a very similar argument for Baphomet we didn't want to engrave seven tenets or anything else because one of our tenets is that uh, we should be able to revise our thinking based upon the best available evidence and therefore you know, monuments, fiats etched in stone goes kind of against that spirit. But we made the argument that Baphomet uh, represented pluralism and with these kind of binary elements, the animal, the human, the male, the female, above, below, the star pointing up, the star with two points up, they, they, it, it symbolized a reconciliation of opposites, and it was meant to sit on a grounds where the Ten Commandments was, were already standing um, as, 
an expression of pluralism and, and the idea that, uh, that that we can coexist and that no no one viewpoint owns the, the public square. That was altogether too much. The uh, the state supreme court eventually ruled against the Ten Commandments monument in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, had been denying our requests, so we were quite ready to to go to court with them. But then the Ten Commandments came down since we were always clear that we only wanted our our monument up where the Ten Commandments were and not to the exclusion of another religious expression. Um, We withdrew our bid. Arkansas started right up. And Arkansas is so much better because we have this great nemesis, this little pecker-headed senator named Jason Rapert who goes around and, and he's dumb enough that every time I put out some kind of statement he throws a little temper tantrum and does a Facebook live video and things like that so he, he makes it so he makes it so much more fun but um, recently uh, they had put the Ten Commandments up and some crazed Christian ran it over uh, Rapert immediately did a, a press conference and when somebody asked him uh, about this mentally ill, born-again Christian who ran over the the monument. He took the opportunity somehow to um, senselessly migrate over into uh, speculating that I myself am mentally ill and probably a criminal. But um, in Arkansas, they tried to do everything they could to make their discrimination against us legal. And they did that by putting forward these standards that said that any monument needed legislative approval. First sponsorship, then its own distinct bill, and then, then the approval of, of the House and the Senate and then the governor. And that doesn't make it less discriminatory to pass it through a bureaucratic process. So in order to prove the discrimination, we then wrote to everybody in the House and Senate and asked them if they would sponsor our monument to go up. And these, uh, I mean, you, you may feel when you get into the field that, that some of the politicians are just acting. They're just pandering to their base, and, and you have to be aware when you're going to debate them. I found that isn't the case. They're genuinely stupid. And many of them emailed back and let it be known very clearly that they would not sponsor our monument request because it is satanic. And one woman in the House wrote back, and she said, you can go to hell, and you can quote me on that. And I said, "Fine, we're going to quote you. In, we're going to quote you in a federal suit, and it's, <laughs> and it's probably going to work out rather well for us." But uh, so we're waiting for the Ten Commandments monument to go back up before we file the lawsuit, um, because we don't we don't necessarily have standing unless the monument is there, even though it had already gone up. Oh, another interesting little side note on the Oklahoma thing: Oklahoma tried again. They passed a bill after the Ten Commandments monument came down. They were still irritated about that. And they, they wanted to put it back up, so they put a bill out. They, they passed a bill that said it was a Historical Monuments Act, and it said that historical monuments that had some kind of historical connection to Arkansas and the United States could be approved for display on the Capitol grounds. Um, items including a monument to the Magna Carta, uh, the 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 Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, and, uh, and the Ten Commandments. And they just kind of weaseled that one in there. <laughs> so we were trying to think of what we could put uh, to kind of counteract that, because these, these seemed more, if, if they were going to go this route, it, it, didn't, it didn't address the illegality of the Ten Commandments and probably wouldn't have stood to begin with. But we decided that if they did do that, we would merely carve the Magna Carta into the back of the Baphomet and call it the front. <laughs> and then we would submit that as our Magna Carta monument without any uh, exposition about the design elements at all. <laughs> but more on, on the idea of the public perception of, of church-state issues and when you allow religion into the public square, um, one occasion where it was, it was very telling to see what the people were saying, I won't play this whole clip, but, but you can hear some of it, was when uh, this Phoenix City Council deliberated about the Satanic Temple giving an invocation at the beginning of a City Council meeting. They were having Christian prayers open up the City Council meetings in our, our uh, Tucson chapter offered to give a Satanic invocation at the beginning of, of a, a meeting. And it was approved. Um, they actually ended up moving over to a moment of silence policy instead and shut, shut it down entirely before allowing 
us to give a uh, oh, one and a half minute invocation, I think it was, um, just because of the horror that struck into the hearts of people. But you'll see that they also felt that this was the, uh, this was the city endorsing a, a religious viewpoint. There is a constitution greater than the American Constitution, and it is substantiated or sustained by God Himself. I'm going to read the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Satanism is not a religion, it's a cult. She's doing good for a moment. Silence prayer as opposed to doing invocations. Is to silence any kind of prayer whatsoever. I take the Pledge of Allegiance. It's one nation under God. That's not out there by mistake. How many people actually have a dollar bill or a piece of money in their wallet or their pocket? I do believe it says, in God we trust. See, it goes on like that, but 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 person after person uh, uh, gets up on the podium and they feel that that minor little items like that, and God we trust on money, uh, the fact that they have been giving Christian prayer, um, really means that that it is a Christian community, and, and all others need not apply or do not have equal benefits to them. And I, I think the things we're doing are a very rude awakening to them, and I think that part of that is due to the. Uh, the overall uh, the overall irresponsibility of the courts, I, I feel, in, in addressing uh, religious religious issues and, and giving uh, religion a blank check for the most part. Um, and a, another way we are trying to kind of counter evangelical indoctrination is with our after school Satan clubs, and those are in response to what are called good news clubs, evangelical after-school after clubs that the Supreme Court allowed on, on free speech argument, argued by the Liberty Council, could use the facilities of schools to teach, uh, to indoctrinate children into this bizarre, uh, isolationist, fundamentalist way of evangelical thinking. And when I, when I say that, um, I, this, isn't, this isn't standard Sunday school material. This really is hellfire and brimstone, a, a curriculum uh, telling children that they will go to hell if they don't if they don't follow the way of the way of Christ, and they claim to be this kind of non-denominational, Bible-centered group, um, and that's true to the point where they, they will accept anybody into their classroom to indoctrinate into this fundamentalist way of thinking. And what we've seen as we've been putting forward the after-school Satan Club, of course, none of the school districts want us. And, and our, uh, it, but our uh, curriculum is very much based upon critical thinking and. and and, and no items of religious opinion, um, just just a just just a critical thinking after school club, but it's just too much that it's run by the Satanic Temple, and we're hoping that it spreads kind of an awareness of who the Good News Clubs are because we've we've kept that in our talking points every time we've we've addressed this this issue, but um, these are just a few of the things that we're doing and a few of the battles that we're fighting and we think that there's a lot at stake with with all of these things and that uh and that we we're glad to be here to be kind of a kind of a counterbalance to what I feel is is a disproportionate weight in favor of evangelical theocratic uh laws and, and regulations that are being put in place today and so uh, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Oh, sorry. No, no he gets to choose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds like the temple is deeply disturbed by the potential government endorsement of religion, specifically Christianity. So just as a spokesperson for the temple, in the ideal setting, would you rather see satanic temples next to other theocratic monuments or to abolish it all? It's kind of a case by case basis. In some cases, I, I, I'm not entirely against the idea, actually, of people being able to argue on the grounds of deeply held belief and a sense of cultural identity that they should not be uh, made by certain government laws or restrictions to to violate their 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 personal beliefs. 
but I think it just it begins to go too far when only one voice is screaming for those privileges, and then you see a real imbalance to, in their favor and in in their favor of discriminating against any other type of group. And I think that's what we see now. I think there's a reasonable plateau where people can make those arguments, and it doesn't have to it doesn't have to distress anybody else or violate their liberties. I think we've crossed that line, though. Uh, in the case of monuments. I think it's fine if they're on a first-come, first-served basis, which they, they usually are, and they have a place kind of sectioned off for each. And after a while, uh, Satanism will lose its shock value to people once people learn what it's about. But at that point, I feel like we'll be accepted into the forums, and this won't be such a big issue anymore. I think, I think that, that path to us being less shocking also comes with a more reasonable society, hopefully. So... It's all for the greater good. The greater good. What is the tenets of Satanism? Oh, don't make me get into that. <laughs> they're they're online though, and there's a, there's a great body of work, and there's a, there's a lot of a lot of literature related to modern Satanism. I would I would direct you to my uh, my site luciangreaves.com, and there's a section library that that has a good deal, a, a number of books. Um, People today are most familiar with Levay and Satanism, which is kind of aberrated, I think, from earlier Satanism, which was more about embracing Enlightenment values for the, for the Miltonic kind of uh, Shelley Blake kind of construct and changing the kind of cultural mythological backdrop to embrace the, the changing world that wasn't feudalistic anymore, wasn't theocratic, and, and had to embrace pluralism, diversity, and different cultures. And that's really, at the end of the day, what I think Satanism is. It's, it's a new mythology for a new Enlightenment culture, and it's a long time in coming. Did you pick Satan as a symbol just because of the shock value, or are there other parts of it that you were drawn to? So, yeah, that's a, there, there's this common idea that we kind of sat around and, and picked uh, a symbol or, or a religious name. That's not, not not really the case. I think most of us were kind of kind of grew up in the Judeo Christian culture and were told certain things and were uh, indoctrinated to believe certain superstitions and religions. And in that way, the idea of Satan as a as a rebel against tyranny really resonated with us in a way that nothing else would, because Satan still does have that kind of rebellious power to us, whether we believe in it theistically or not. It just can't be separated. It's, it would be impossible for us to just rename and re-mythologize the entire thing. So I don't know if that I don't know if that makes sense to you because I find myself explaining this all the time. It's something I think it, it either resonates with you or it doesn't. So let's say you um, try to uh, keep making things. So let's say you go to a baker and you want that beautiful red and black satanic cake and a baker says, you know what, the baker's evangelical and he says, you know what, forget my religion I only make blue cakes. Um, I'm an artist, and just like you can't ask a modern artist to do a classical landscape, you can't ask a blue cake artist to make a red cake. Um, what would you say to the baker in that case, and what would you say to the evangelical, evangelical baker who asserts a similar type? And well, I, I don't find those similar, because it's a difference between uh, making a judgment on who the person is who's coming into you, and then somebody putting forward what kind of art they do or don't do. I, I guess you could say similarly, like, I can't put... Uh, I can't put a same-sex couple on, on, on a cake because because that's not the type of art I do. I don't know. That's 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 more of an expression of values than than like a, a than like color palette art. I guess we're getting into a pretty a, a type of gray area there. But as I as I look at this issue, I keep thinking about uh, race relations. Race is no different as a protected class than religion. They're not different types of protected class, they're just protected class. So I, I, I wonder, um, I, I think everybody agrees that having race as a protected class and, and not allowing some kind of uh, some kind of isolated little group to decide they're not going to, be, they're going to divide their community in that way is a bad thing. I think it's rather similar with, with orientation. I honestly think orientation should be a protected class. I, 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 I don't... Uh, I, I don't understand why, why in a civil society we can't have some basic rules. I understand the rights of of, of, of bakers. I, I 
I'm all about people's individual freedom uh, until I feel that it's it's very divisive to a community at large. And I don't think it's very I don't think it's very prohibitive to people to be made to make to, to make products for somebody of a different race or, or not not question uh, not not question who the buyer is. I mean, if if you want to enter into the market, there's going to be some market rules, and I I I mean that that's where I lean on that. I mean, there's a lot to kind of be parsed out. Perhaps in the gray areas, but, but that's where I am. What is the difference between religion and a cult? <laughs> well, a cult is. It, it, see, that's a rather deep question too, and that could be a whole lecture of its own. But um, we do have people throw around the word cult a lot, and usually that's just uh, that's just their way of saying that this is. Not, not the mainstream religion. This is something outside the, the, the norm. But to me, uh, the, the word cult means more than that, and it is a useful term to distinguish uh, organizations that demand a cult-like relationship from its members. And those are usually very uh, insular groups. You're not allowed to question the, the values and the fiats being put forward. They're usually very uh, hierarchical, um, and they, they have very very specific demands upon their, their membership. And a lot of that it runs very contrary to our own way of thinking, which is to build critical thinking and to cause people to, to question the values around them and, 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 uh, and, and the rules that, they're being, that are being weighed upon them, even within our, our own organization. I don't feel we run too much of a risk of, of any of our chapters ever becoming a cult because we have kind of a general culture of non cultishness <laughs> Yeah, um, you talked a lot about religious pluralism, so I'm wondering if other underrepresented uh, religions have reached out to show support for your cause in that way. Yeah, um, and sometimes, you know, we're not sure we want the affiliation, but... Um, <laughs> But I can't be be too sure. Um, we have had some positive feedback from interfaith groups only in recent times. Now that we've been doing this for years, and people see what we're doing, and that there's an actual benefit to it. I, I'm sure it's confusing when other religious groups see something like the Good News Clubs, who they really dislike, and see us being absolutely on point as to what they are and why this is important. I think it makes them think a lot differently about who we are and what we're doing. Uh, Just the same, we were in Florida offering uh, satanic activity books uh, to be distributed for passive distribution in a school where they were allowing for the passive distribution of evangelical material. There again, they shut down the entire forum and said, okay, now now nobody can pass out literature at all. But uh, the Freedom from Religion Foundation went went crazy and started inviting every religious group, and the Raelians were supposed to come. And the Raelians are like this UFO, perhaps cult, with uh, <laughs> with, with that use uh, swastikas as their symbols. And at the time, they had a lot of good things to say about us. And I've, I, was, I mean, I know people feel the same about us when we take up a cause. They think maybe maybe we don't want them, but I don't know. Alex. I'm a little confused about like the end game here. Is is the idea that um, to, to like to to get our share in the society, enlightenment folks have to like form groups and say, hey, look, we're religions too, because the First Amendment, after all, does say religion, and for it to mean anything, religion has to demarcate some type of conduct and behavior from some other type of conduct and behavior that's not religion, because you know I'm a total and Enlightenment Darwinian atheist. I'm also not a joiner, right? I don't like. To, you know, I don't. I don't feel. I don't want to be in a group. I don't really want to be in groups like that or, or anything like that. So, like, do I get no protection unless I also play into this thing where I'm like, okay, I got to form a religion so we can like have our statues there uh, too and like and get the protection? Or is the whole idea to like use this strategy to show the court ultimately? And this this is what I would like that this whole religious exceptionalism thing can't work in this modern. Society, and that at some level, the First Amendment free exercise is on a collision course with equal protection, and that's just the way it, it's got to be. Or like, do you, sorry, did that make any sense? No, I, I, well, I mean, we, we work on these things on a case-by-case basis, so the, the end games are, are different in different areas of this. Like I said, I feel like there's a reasonable plateau, but currently, you're right. For somebody like you, I, I think the current perspective is 
fuck you, you're nobody. You know, you, you don't speak for anybody, and, and you, you know, people can perhaps discriminate against you or, or have privileges that you don't have because you can't cite a belief. And I, I think that's wrong. If you look at the earlier writings of Jefferson when he was talking about his conception of religious liberty, he was very clear that what he saw as being protected was religious opinion, and religious opinion for infidels and heretics as well as people with superstitious beliefs. So my personal feeling is that if you have a set of deeply held beliefs, and, and I, I'm sure there's case law that's that, uh, touched on this with the issue of conscientious objectors during the wars, and I haven't read enough of that yet, and I've been meaning to, but I, I do feel that of somebody who has opinions about religion and, and any sense of kind of... Uh, of, of deeply held beliefs, you should be able to make whatever arguments you can make too. But what that calls for is a complete revision of the, the legalistic thinking about how the, such cases are vetted and, and what kind of history you have showing this kind of adherence to these beliefs. I mean, it's more, it's easier for established religions and people who have that kind of that kind of background. But right now, I, I do see religion as really having this carte blanche that it shouldn't. And, I mean, a lot of... We're just going to have to see how a lot of this plays out. I mean, the, there isn't a specific end game, but I think right now we're, we're isolating the problem and confronting that. One more question? Oh, two more questions. Uh, yeah, you a lot of litigation. Yeah, not very well. It's, it's, <laughs> it really hurt our feelings to not get pro bono support for the reproductive rights cases in Missouri. We thought we would get that, and we didn't. And we had to file the suit pretty pretty quickly after she was denied our exemption. And we still don't have pro bono support for that, despite the attention it's gotten from legal scholars and other lawyers. Uh, on the plus side, our, our lawyer working that case now does have a whole team of very qualified people willing to do research for him and, and willing to analyze his briefs and, and things like that. But for the most part, you know, Tucker was uh, was very upset, I guess, about the idea of getting us publicity. Thanks for inviting me on the show. You know, but, <laughs> but um, you know, we need, we need the public consciousness to, to be aware of what we're doing and, and and only in that way can we fund these things. When we're when we're big news, people donate to these campaigns, and that will sustain the campaign thereafter. Usually, unless you know, until the news comes up again, you know, you you can be huge in the news. You're going to be getting uh, crowdfunding for uh, not not an entire week based on that news. You know, your your old news the day after the the article comes out. So that's how we've been doing it so far. We've just kind of barely been making it by. So. You know, if you know any, if you know any very rich benefactors who are interested, <laughs> take it. <laughs> One more question. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming.